today, getting into the last weeks. So you guys are the last stragglers that don't have all of your lecture credits in. Is this your last one? Or do some of you still have more to go? More? I, I know that your team, about all of you, still need some, but you've been here most of the time. Uh, so we've got what, about 16 of you today. It's not too bad. Um, so we're going to talk about risk analysis. But what we're really going to talk about today is one tool for risk analysis, which is a failure modes and effects analysis. Has anybody done one of these before? One of you? Yes. Yes, you did. <laughs> okay. So uh, an FMEA is probably the most common tool that you will see used in industry for risk analysis in a project. So when you say, I'm going to test my device, what you're going to test and how you should test it should all be driven from your FMEA. Okay? So it might not be the most accurate tool, um, but it is one that you will use in your career almost for certain. So what is an FMEA? Well, the, it's a, just simply a step-by-step -step approach for determining all the risks in your project. And those could be any type of risk. Um, usually you'll do different FMEAs for different parts of your project. So you would have a design FMEA, which is looking specifically at how this design could fail. And then if you're going to manufacture that product, uh, you would do a process or a manufacturing FMEA, looking at all the ways that you could incorrectly manufacture it. Okay, so you look at um, a, a lot of different steps there. So um, in, in all those phases, you have to do these. You'll hear these uh, called FEMAs or FAMICAs. The C in that is for criticality. Um, FMEA, PFMEA, DFMEA, all these are kind of this family of terms talking about um, failure mode analysis. So the, the failure mode is talking about the, the means or the ways in which something can fail, and that could be absolutely anything. So you could look at, um, you know, this table and say, I, I know this table needs to be able to withstand 400 pound load. Um, and those are all driven from your specifications, right? So you guys probably remember, most of you are here for user needs and specifications lectures. Um, we talked about user needs being primary features, specifications being the quantification of those. So we're trying to say, not just this table should be strong, but that it should hold this many pounds for this long. And this is where you're going to go through and list those risks, OK? Um, we're especially interested in risks that affect the customer when we're doing a DFMEA. So most of you, if you do this for your project, will be doing a DFMEA, and you're thinking about customer. What could they do that would, get, that would cause them to be hurt or uh, cause the device to fail on them at a critical time, things like that? And the effect analysis piece is looking at the consequence of the failure um, and doing an analysis there. So that's where we're getting to um, what could go wrong, how can we test it to make sure it doesn't happen, or test it to see how often it would happen, and what can we do to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, so why, doing the, why do this? Pre prevent injury um, is one of the biggest things. So we never want to put a product on the market that will cause physical injury to anybody. So if you're a civil engineer, this would be a really big deal to you. You don't want to design the bridge that falls or the building that gets crushed, right? Um, but it could be really in any industry. Uh, so we want to look at all those things. We want to talk about um, commercial failure. So example I like to use for that is the company SanDisk makes those little SD cards that you use in your phone, things like that, right? There's really no safety risk there at all, right? They're probably not going to shock you or explode in your face if you put too much data on them. Right? They're, they're really not a risk for that. But what if SanDisk put out a disk that every time the temperature hit freezing, they erased, right? So if they didn't think through all the things could happen and something like that happened, what would that do to their company? It would probably put them out of business, right? Because you know, memory storage is all about reliability. You want to know for sure that what you put there is going to stay there. So those kind of security things could put them out of business and cause everyone who works there to be unemployed, right? So that's a huge risk to them as a company, even though it has nothing to do with safety. So it's a good example of a commercial or a business risk. And those are the kind of things you want to think through. So in, in any given project that you're doing, in your EPICS projects, it might not cause someone to be hurt, but how could it affect your community partner organization if this thing fails in a given way? 
So when to do the FEMA. Uh, most of you in your projects, if you do these, you'll do them at the end because your advisor will say, okay, great, you're done. You have a prototype you want to deliver. Did you do a risk analysis? Did you do any testing? And you'll do this at the end. That's not the best way to do it at all. And it, when you're in industry, you should never do it that way. As soon as you have specifications, you can do this. Okay. So even though you don't know what your design is, you haven't designed anything yet, at least in theory, um, you can go through and do this. Because you said, I had a specification that I'm, I'm designing a thing that should withstand 400 pounds. I can test that or consider the effects of that before I've ever designed the table. Okay? So I could think through, how do I need to test whatever it is I'm going to come up with that's going to hold um, that kind of a load. And then as your project progresses, you should update your FEMA to match that progress you're in. Okay? So you can keep building on this document. So when you talk about a living document, this is a great example. Start at the beginning, think through the basic parts when your mind's not clouded with the details of your design. And then as you design, you can come back and iterate on this. So everything in engineering uh, comes around to be an iterative process. And that's a good thing. There's a reason for that. Um, so do it early and often, specification driven. Um, anytime you do a process change, anytime you do a change to your product, you don't want to do this. So in your Epics projects, you usually will just deliver up front. But a lot of times those come back, right? Something broke, something that you didn't expect happened. And you want to go back and say, OK, we didn't account for this. Why not? What other things might we think of now that we can add in and update later on in the process? When you have um, products that you have on the commercial market, you'll have some design control process. And usually in that process, you'll say, OK, we changed the print for this part, so it's a little bit different. We need to go through and do these steps. And one of those will be updating your FEMA. Think about what could fail now that wouldn't have failed before. Um, hi. Yeah, grab a Scantron. Um, and then another one will be when you're doing periodic review. So if you put a, a product into market, you'll probably say, we're going to review this product three months after it's on the market, a year after it's on the market, five years after it's on the market. Those kind of periodic checks to say what's happening with this product out in the field. And that's a great time, again, to come through and do this. So you won't be doing that with your Epics projects, but you will be doing it outside of that. Hi. You're late. So um, one thing, I, we're going to go into an example, and that's going to take up most of our time. Uh, Actually, I'm going to walk you through an example and then have you do one. But first, I'm going to talk about uh, what's called a risk priority number. And this is a pretty simple concept, but it's just trying to quantify what those risks are with each of your um, projects. So first one is you, you'll give a score for severity. Most of these will do 1 through 10 for each of these three items and multiply them together. So you could get up to 1,000 um, points of an RPN. Not everyone does it that way. It's fairly arbitrary, but it's one way to do it. So severity is how serious are the consequences, right? So if you're designing that bridge, if the bridge crumbles, that's high severity. If the bridge looks ugly and the people in the town don't like it, it's a risk, but it's a lower risk, right? Um, occurrence is how likely is it to happen? So is this a very uncommon occurrence? Is it 1 in 10 million, or is it 1 in 100, which would actually be probably a very high occurrence, right? depending on what you're looking at. So if you have um, you know, a failure of um, an ink pen, 1 in 100 isn't a big deal. If you have a failure of a pacemaker, 1 in 100 is a very big deal. So you have to p put all these things in context of your project in the context of use of your project. Right? And then the last one is detection. So this is how likely are we to catch this before it the, the effects actually happen? Right. So this especially comes into process um, with a process Fumica when you're looking at when we're making this. If we drill too far, too deep in this hole, we'll break through the other side of the part, and that would be a failure. But we would see it right away, and we can throw that part away and make another one. That risk is low. If you wouldn't know it was there until it was in the field, and then it fails, that would be um, a negative for your project. So that's why the detection piece comes into play. So when you multiply these three together, the higher score you have, the more concerning that issue would be, and the more you'll want to do to address it and make sure that you um, try and reduce that number. So you'll usually go through, assign all of these severity occurrence and detection numbers 
without any kind of control on them, like you didn't do anything to account for it. And then you'll want to come up with measures to reduce that number and then get an updated number based on those. You usually won't be able to reduce the severity, okay? So if there's some risk that would cause the bridge to fall, that severity doesn't change because you did something else usually. Um, but what you can do is drop the occurrence or the detection number so that you can be more likely to catch it or you will make it less likely to happen, okay? So you may say, I'm gonna add a reinforcing member to that bridge to drop the probability of that happening. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? So those are the numbers you're gonna go, go through. Um, so I'm going to walk you through actually how to open up a PFAMICA or a FAMICA um, template on the website of the American Society for Quality. The reason why I'm going to walk you through doing it rather than just opening it up is I want to show you how to get to some of this information because it's very useful. So there is an organization called the American Society for Quality. These are um, the group that represents quality engineers in general um, and people who work in the quality field. And they're a fairly no-nonsense bunch, as you can see by their not-too-fancy website. There's no pictures or anything like that. Um, but if you go to their Knowledge Center over here on the left and then look at Tools and say All Tools, there is a whole bunch of useful stuff here that you can put to work for you that they provide for free. So some of the things that we've talked about um, before, like a Gantt chart. You have a Gantt chart template in here. Um, design of experiments are very useful. Um, some of the Ishikawa bone diagram, things like that, that you might use in your career. They provide for you here. So this is a resource that it's helpful to know about because if you ever need to do some kind of documentation and you don't know how it works, they give you templates and they also give you instructions on how to use them, which are very helpful. So the example we're talking about today, uh, an FMEA, so failure modes effects analysis, they have a lengthy description about what this means um, and when to use it, how to use it, and it walks you through step by step how to do it, um, even with an example. So if you need help with any of these kind of um, you know, industrial process type um, documentation, this is a good place to go. And along with that page describing it, you have this template. So, can you guys, does that help a little bit? Um, is that, can you see that? Do I need to blow it up? Um, so it'll, it'll walk you through even again here a little bit about how to put these together. Um, but what you'll notice is you'll have uh, an item so this could be a process. So in this case, it's a process of drilling a hole. Uh, but this could be, uh, so that's a P FEMA. It's looking at the, a process. Or you could also be looking at something to do with your design. So you could say, I'm designing a skateboard. That could be the item that you're talking about here, OK? Um, you'll have a listing of the core team. And so that should be the people who have created this document. And it should include all of the relevant people in your team who have done that. So if you have on your Epix team, the design lead and the team members, that would be appropriate. When you move into industry, you'll probably have someone from um, the design group, the quality group, manufacturing group, um, and go through and do that. Uh, oftentimes, there's a number assigned to the FMEA. There's really no reason for you to do that um, for your EPICS project. But you will want to give it a date and, and a revision um, number or letter so that when you update this, you know which one you're looking at. So as we go through and look um, at each of these, you'll see the severity, um, the occurrence, and the detection, as we talked about. They've given these a, a 0 to 10 number. So for the process of drilling a hole, they've listed two potential failure modes, one being that the hole is drilled too deep, and one being that um, it's not deep enough. So they're saying those are the only two mistakes that I can make on drilling a hole. Uh, there are certainly other things that could happen, like the wrong diameter, the wrong angle. Um, but just as an example, this would give you these two that they've identified. Um, so for 
uh, drilling the blind hole. They're saying the effect of that failure would be breaking through the bottom of whatever you're drilling into. Okay. They've given that a pretty high severity number of seven. So these are just relative severity numbers. You may want to specify what these mean, and they may actually have done that over here. No. Um, so oftentimes in industry, you'll see what those severity numbers mean or some guidance as to what they mean. Um, but here it's just an arbitrary um, 0 to 10 rating. Um, I'm not sure what the class group means, and they, they haven't actually used that. Um, the potential cause, they're saying, would be improper machine setup. And the occurrence, they're giving a low score of 3, saying it's unlikely that we drill too far. And the reason for that is because we have some operator training instructions. They give a detection, the number is being fairly low, multiply those together to get the RPM. They then don't have any recommended actions or an action plan because this number was sufficiently low at 63. Okay? So usually you'll have some threshold value that you want to set and say anything above 100, we're going to have some action plan to reduce it. Uh, and what you allow that number to be depends on the purpose of your project. right? So if you're working on the space shuttle, you're not going to let any of these be very high at all. You probably have a very low tolerance. Um, but if you're working on um, you know, a cap for a milk carton, it's probably are going to have less. Um, you probably won't be quite as tight with that RPN number. Um, looking at the hole being not deep enough, uh, it would cause an incomplete thread form if you're threading the hole. And they're saying there are two different potential causes. So you can see for any given function, you can have multiple failure modes. For each failure mode, you can have multiple causes. So they're saying it could be improper machine setup again or a broken drill bit. Um, and those have different processes and occurrence ratings. They're saying the occurrence of a broken drill bit would be more likely. Um, and there's no protection for that now. They're saying because of that, their score of 255 is above their threshold, so they have an action plan to install tool detectors. Um, they've then given these some responsibility to someone that has to carry them out. So they've looked to say, yes, this has been done. And then after that action, you rescore. So like I said, the severity rarely goes down. So the severity stayed the same. In this case, the occurrence actually stays the same, but the detection becomes much better. Okay? So they're saying, we, we put in some process to make sure that when this happens, because we couldn't stop it from happening, that we know about it. Okay? They could have reduced their occurrence by saying we're going to change the drill bits every other operation or something to try and reduce how often that happens. Does that make sense to everybody, the kind of basic form of this? So now this is for a process, um, and you guys tend to work more in the realm of design, at least right now. A lot of you will go into manufacturing quality when you move on into your career. So it's a good thing to understand. Um, so I want to just go ahead and go into an exercise that'll take a, a good bit of the rest of the time. So we'll take at least 10 minutes. Um, so we want to divide up into four teams. Um, so if we can just count off for those four teams, you'd be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. All right, so if you'll get in with the team and your number, um, we're going to have four different product products, and each team will pick one of these. So who's on team one? OK, team one, would you like webcam, a smartphone, a canoe, or a hydro jetpack? Hydro jetpack. OK, team four. Team four? It's your choice. Smartphone? Smartphone. Team three? Canoe? All right, then team two, you get whatever was left, uh, which was what, webcam? Webcam. All right, so I'll give you, L, uh, we'll give you till five after, okay? Uh, and then after you're done, I'm going to have you come up and present your findings. I will show you a real failure for each of these devices and see if you've covered it in your FMEA, okay? You can feel free to do it on paper or go through and download the template, whichever you prefer.
Which uh, do you mean? I don't know what number did I tell you? I didn't memorize this many numbers just now. I don't know. P pick a group and work with them. It doesn't matter. What product are you guys doing? Canoe. Canoe? It's a good one. You gonna do it on paper or are you gonna download the template? You know, what's bad is I don't edit these videos, so when people watch these after the fact, they have 15 minutes of watching nothing. <laughs> I, I hope that they will, you know, sit down and do the exercise, but I'm suspicious that they don't. No, we collect them at the end. You guys working on the template or on paper? paper. Is paper? the paper just write down? Mm -hmm. Don't we just need to do like the SOD and multiply it? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just want to make sure you cover all the risks. What do you mean? Wh which is your product? The smartphone. So you thinking about all the ways that a f smartphone could fail. Okay. So it would be a bit. This is probably one of them. Yeah. It should be a good lengthy list. What are you guys doing, webcam? Uh, Hydro jetpack. Jet yeah. It is the best one. You have three plain things and then a jetpack. So you guys just do it on paper or are you gonna use the template? It's template, but it's It's just a spreadsheet, it's taking that long. Yeah. Go to the Knowledge Center, yeah. and then Tools. Yeah. You go back to so that one underneath it? Yeah. Yeah. Tools. tools, and then do View All. Oh. Yeah. Like, is somewhere still here? Is that all? Yeah. Like, mine doesn't have, <laughs> mine doesn't have a tax for that. So, so in design, I think, what are ideas for that? On your, on your wallet? Uh, or get a whole one. Think about how much stuff, and like, yeah. perhaps yeah. some programs need to be in-house. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
one is like a nine and the second one is like a ten because if it's too dense it wouldn't even have like the ability to fit in the water versus if number two is yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay the next thing is potential causes or mechanisms of failure. How's it going? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to word it. Can't do now. Comprehensible. You trying to discover new ways to break it? <laughs> so wait, are we trying to find like an overall SOD or like RPN or something, or are we just talking about what we? So you want to create the list of all of the failure modes you can think okay. of, and then you want to assign uh, an RPN score to each of those. Okay. So when you when we present it, do you want us to talk? What would you like for us to present? So come up and say here here are the different risks that we came up with and how, what each RPN was and how you came up with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 